Welcome to Truth in History, where we will discover together how history becomes prophecy in the making, and prophecy reflects history as it's being fulfilled. Now, here's your host, Pastor Charles Jennings. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. We definitely need to hear what the Spirit of God is speaking through this Word that He has given us. Because the Bible tells us that the Word of God came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And what did they speak? They spoke a holy word. And we're going back to continue our study concerning the wilderness temptation of Jesus, found in Matthew chapter 4. Now, the first temptation that the tempter came to Jesus with was in the area of natural, physical desire, and that was for food, to satisfy the hunger of the human body. And the tempter wanted Jesus to perform a miracle. So they challenged Jesus' office as prophet, because in the Old Testament many prophets performed miracles. So in other words, you're a prophet, go ahead and perform a miracle, change these stones into bread. And Jesus answered on the basis of it is written. In other words, just like the Apostle Paul told us in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, putting on the whole armor of God and part of the Christian's armor is to have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We must be armed, fully armed, with God's Word to combat Satan when he comes to us. And not only Satan himself, but his representatives. Because, have you ever, let, let me ask you this, talking about Satan and talking about the accusations that comes against Christians or an individual. Jesus turned to Peter one day and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, have you ever had, quote, the devil to give you a hard time? Have you ever had the devil to come and insult you or offend you? How did he do it? He did it through an individual. Usually the devil will use another person, and that person does not have to be demon-possessed. That person doesn't have to be a sinner. That person can be a Christian. Jesus spoke to Peter, one of the apostles, and called him Satan, the accuser. It's other Christians oftentimes where we receive our greatest hurt because they are acting as the accuser on the part of Satan. Temptation number two that the tempter came to Jesus with, and that was in the realm of religious authority. As we read in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 5, it says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Now, if this was just a mental battle that Jesus was having, was it just in his own mind that he went to the city of Jerusalem, where the temple was located, went in the temple, climbed the stairs, and went to the top corner. Because this pinnacle, according to Josephus, Josephus, was called the King's Gallery. And it was erected by Herod, the man who spent 46 years in building this temple. And it was the top corner on the southern edge 
of the temple, on the southern part of the temple, and looking over the valley of Hanan, and the floor of that valley was 700 feet below. And Satan says, Cast thyself down, because it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. In other words, the angels will take care of you. But Jesus said, He comes back with the word of God. It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now what does the word tempt here mean in this case? If you look it up, it means to expose yourself to danger with vain presumption that God will protect you. Let me repeat that. To tempt God means this, to expose yourself to danger with vain and foolish presumption, presumption that God will protect you in this foolish act that you have decided to do. That's tempting God. Now, do you think that Satan physically took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple? Or do you think that it was possibly the Pharisees and the Sadducees that said, now, work with us. Be part of us. They took him to the temple, which was the epitome of Jewish society at that time. That was the headquarters of the Jewish religion, being in the city of Jerusalem. So this, they were tempting him in the realm of religious authority. This is the place that God said He would put His name forever. This is the place where the Shekinah glory of God shone down upon the most holy place. This is the place where the Holy of Holies is located. This is the place that has the Ark of the Covenant and the altar of incense. And this is the place where the Ark of the Covenant is located with the angels above it, the seraphim. So that's why they took him there. It was the location of everything that God had established in the Old Testament. You see, it was the, the mercy seat from whence God spoke to His people in the Old Testament. So they took Him to this location. This was the headquarters of religious authority of the Jewish religion of that day. So why not take Him there? Say, cast yourself down. They wanted to retain their position as religious authorities in Jerusalem and over the people. And they could hold that position through the distortion of the law, misinterpretations of the law of Moses. And that way they could hold their position if Jesus would only cooperate with them. It was the devil, all right. It was Satan, all right, trying to thwart the plan of God. And we see later on where in the Garden of Gethsemane, if he could have just let Jesus die in the Garden of Gethsemane before going to the cross, the plan of salvation would have not been completed. So therefore, Satan is out to thwart, to circumvent the plan of salvation. So here early on in the ministry of the Lord Jesus, 
if we could only get him off track, if we could only get the Lord Jesus sidetracked, and we are challenge him on the basis of his sonship. If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, cast yourself down. That's what He's doing to every believer. If you're a child of God, do so and so. But we must place ourselves under the protection of the Almighty and the bounds of the Word of God. And they even misquoted the Scripture. The Pharisees knew the Scripture. It says, this is what the tempter said, He shall give His angels charge concerning thee, but they left out in all thy ways. From Psalm 91. And Jesus gave them His answer. From the book of Deuteronomy, it is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. They brought Him to the temple. Now who operate or who operated, what class of people, according to the law of Moses, operated in the temple? It was the priest. That's where they operated. That was the seat of religious authority invested in the priest of the Old Testament, the family of Aaron. So they were challenging Jesus on the basis of His priesthood. The first temptation, they challenged Jesus' office as prophet. You're a miracle worker. The second temptation, they challenged Jesus and His office as priest. And Jesus is our high priest. And they knew that salvation came through the priesthood. So if they could just thwart that, if they could get Him off track, if they could do something, so that He would not fulfill the plan of salvation. They could retain their religious authority. The holy city, the pinnacle of the temple, they challenged Him. Now, the third temptation. The third temptation is in the realm of political authority. Let's read this, beginning with verse number 8, Matthew chapter 4. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Now, let's think. If Jesus was alone in the wilderness, how would the devil take him to the highest mountain so that he could see the kingdoms of the world. Was it in vision form? Did Jesus have a vision? Did Satan have the authority to mentally transport Jesus to the highest mountain? Did Satan have the authority to visibly and physically transport Jesus to the highest mountain? And if there was a high mountain there, high enough, would it be high enough, elevated enough to see all of the known world at that time and the glory of each particular kingdom? Because if he's in the wilderness of Judea, where would that mountain have been? Where would that mountain have physically been? high enough. It was a verbal proposition 
that the Herodians, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, backed up by the chief priests and the elders. It was a proposition that they were making him. In other words, like this, Jesus, we know that there is a king prophesied in the Old Testament that's going to come and rule God's people Israel. In fact, Nathaniel, when he first saw Jesus, he said, Thou art the Son of God, Thou art the King of Israel. When we read uh, Matthew chapter 2, what is the question that is asked of these wise men? Where, what, is, what is the question? Where is he that is born King of the Jews? This was at his birth. So these Pharisees knew that these wise men were asking concerning a king, and it turned out to be Jesus. Also in Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse number 4, And when he had gathered, this is Herod, And when he had gathered the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. You see, they knew the law. They knew the prophecies of the Old Testament. So therefore, they knew the concept of kingship, that was dwelling, or the office of kingship that was dwelling in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they said, this man is going to be king someday. So why not cut him off at the pass? What about the slaughter of the male babies? Why? Because this child would be a threat to Herod and to the Herodians, to the to the Herod family, which were half Edomites. If you'll read every, every commentary, they uh, point out the fact that Herod was a half Edomite, but Jewish by religion. By blood, he could have had Jewish blood and Edomite blood, but by religion, he adhered to Judaism. That's plain in every, every Bible commentary. So therefore, there was a hatred there. And the Pharisees, the Herodian party, they knew that this man, Jesus, was going to be the king. What about Gabriel's promise to Mary in Luke chapter 1? When Gabriel said, That which is born of thee is of the Holy Ghost, and he shall be great, and I shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Wow! King! And he shall rule over the house of Jacob forever. This is kingship. You see, they challenged Jesus, all three offices that Jesus held, prophet, priest, and king. They challenged him on, uh, they challenged his, his office as prophet. They challenged in the second temptation his office as priest. Now they are challenging his office as king. And the mockery at his trial by these same people, the mockery at his trial by these same Jewish authorities, we read this in Matthew 27, verse 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. Verse 29, And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, a reed in his hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews. That was the Roman soldiers. In verse 37, But where did they get the idea that he would be king of of the Jews. They got it from the religious authorities of that day. And set up over his head his accusation written, This is the king of the Jews. 
Verse 41, this is Matthew 27. Likewise also the chief priest, mocking him, with the scribes and the elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. If he be the king of Israel. You see, they were mocking his office as king. And we see other scriptures that point out the, the very same thing. In Mark chapter 15, verses 9 and 10, we read these words. Mark 15, 9 and 10. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. Pilate knew that the chief priests had delivered Jesus to Pilate because of envy. And at one point they cried out, We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. So we see this, this going on in the life of Jesus from his temptation in the wilderness to his very uh, trial in Herod's court and his crucifixion on the cross. So, going back to, to Matthew 4, 8. Again the devil takes him, an exceeding high mountain, and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said unto him, All these things I will give you. Now, where is that high mountain? Mountains in the Bible is symbolic of kingdoms or governments. And what was the highest mountain at that time? It was the Roman government. Just think, if you could become a Caesar, a Herod, if you could become uh, the leader, the very top man of the Roman Empire, you will look down upon all the smaller kingdoms of this world. I will give you this if you will just simply fall down and worship me. If you will bow down, we will not turn you in to the Roman authorities. You can set up your kingdom. You will be the top man. And Jesus answered him, answered and said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaves him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto the Lord Jesus. You see, folks, the first temptation, they were challenging Jesus' office as prophet. If they could just do away with this man, that is the epitome of the Word of God. Because prophets spoke words. Prophets spoke the Word of God at the door of the temple or at the gate of the city. But this prophet became the Word if they could just do away with him. At this point, we won't have to worry about him any longer. And then the second temptation, if we could just subvert him as priest, if we could just, just hold on to our authority because this man is going to challenge us, this man is going to be the priest. He's going to bring as high priest of Melchizedek order, he's going to bring all of our job to a close of the, the animal sacrifice and, and all the graft that went along with it. And then they challenge Jesus' office as king, political authority. But Jesus came back with it is written, because Jesus is king, and you worship kings. Either our God, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, will be our king, 
or our earthly king will be our God. And we know from the book of Revelation that Jesus is king because it says, and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of His Christ. And it also tells us in Revelation 19 that the armies followed Him and a his name is called the Word of God. And He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And He hath on His vesture and on His thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And Pilate even asked Him, Art thou a king? And He said, To this end was I born. To this end was I born. I pray that this series of lessons has been an eye-opener to each one of us because it gives us an opening plot and a setting for the whole ministry of Jesus and the hatred that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians had for the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus said, Beware of three elements the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of the Sadducees, and the leaven of the Herodians, or the leaven of Herod. Again, I would like to say that if you have not received a copy of our free magazine, please write for it or call for it. You can call or write the number that is on the screen and we'll be glad to put you on the list. Now, if you do not desire to receive any subsequent magazines, you just simply contact us and we will take your name off of our mailing list. It's just that simple. And I pray that the Spirit of God will be in us and the Word of God will be in us just like it was in the Lord Jesus. He knew the Word of God when Satan and his emissaries came to him. He knew the Word of God. He said, it is written. And we must have that within us also. And Paul told us to take on the whole armor of God, and part of that armor was the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Folks, we must know this book, and this book must become a living Word within us, not just letters on a page, but a living Word within us, so that when Satan comes to us as the accuser, or someone speaking on the part of Satan, we can say, it is written, get thee behind me, Satan. God bless each one of you. Until next time. For any material offered on this program, please write or call for your copy today. May God bless you for your response and for being a part of this end-time ministry.